Congressman Lasserette, thanks for joining us this week. It's good to see you. We're broadcasting from Cleveland this week. I know, and it's beautiful here, isn't it? It's, it's nice. If you like snow, it's beautiful. 14 degrees. And I do like snow, and I like cold. Right. First issue I want to talk to you about this week, the much-anticipated Dave Camp comprehensive tax reform bill was released this week. A lot of reviews out there. Talk to us a little bit about it. Well, it's an exciting week because a lot of folks have been buzzing about comprehensive tax reform for a long time. The last time we had comprehensive tax reform in the United States was 1986. So obviously it's a it's not easy to do, or so they do it on a more regular basis. And all eyes were on Dave Camp, the uh, Michigan Republican, who's the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, and he rolled out his, his package that basically is designed to simplify the tax code. It's uh, designed to reduce uh, top-line uh, tax rates for individuals and corporations to 25%, which is uh, significant. Uh, it has uh, a lot of people uh, sort of standing up and cheering, and it has a lot of critics because, you know, if, if you remember when the uh, United States income tax started, there was a one-page form, and you basically wrote down how much you made, and you paid the government 1%. Now it's about 50,000 pages <laughs> because everybody has a yes, but. Well, okay, I think that's, you know, I want to... I want a flat tax, but I would like to, if you're a realtor or a banker, I'd like to have the home interest mortgage deduction carve out or the charitable contribution carve out. And that's how you get to 50,000 pages. So there's a lot to pick on. Uh, I, I think the good news is it, it's now a template that's out there to not only accept praise, but also criticism and take arrows. Uh, but because this is an election year, it's really not going to happen this year. But I don't consider that to be all bad because now people will have a year to digest it, and when the next Congress comes in in 2015, after the elections, they'll have the opportunity to say, well, this is going to be our starting point. How can we get it done? So if we're not going to move comprehensive tax reform, and it sounds like we're not going to, yeah. extenders, talk to us about that real quickly. Well, uh, there are 55 separate tax provisions called extenders, and basically those are targeted uh, as an example, the research and, and development tax credit. So a corporation that wants to engage in research and development, they, they get to write some of that off. Something called the production tax credit, and so very big in the wind industry. And, and it, some people complain it gives them a competitive advantage over other sources of fuel, but, but if, if you make wind turbines, you get uh, the ability to take a, a, a tax advantage. They are traditionally passed for a short period of time and they expire. Fifty-five of them have expired or are about to expire. And so the, the conventional thinking is, uh, again, like with the comprehensive tax reform, some people love the extenders, uh, some people love some of the extenders, and some people hate uh, some combination. And so the, the Congress will, in fact, have to come up with a, a package, an extenders package, um, probably sometime before the July 4th recess. Uh, and, and people that care about it uh, should really sort of perk up and pay attention because I, I, I can tell you right now all 55 are not going to be extended. Uh, and, you, you know, if you have a, a favorite uh, dog in that fight, you should probably make sure that, that uh, you're paying attention. Well, another issue that folks haven't been talking about, but I suspect a lot more people are going to start paying attention to, is transportation bill. Yeah. Highway Trust Fund is projected to run out of money by the end of this summer. Yeah. President Obama was in uh, Minnesota this week. Mm -hmm. He unveiled a $302 billion for over four-year transportation bill, which not paid for. Uh, but it has begun the conversation. Yeah. What are we What are we looking at? What do the next couple of months look like for the, the transportation bill? Well, I, for those of you that don't follow this issue on a daily basis, uh, since 1991, the federal government has had in place a six-year transportation bill. And so when you buy a gallon of gasoline, 18 cents of, of the price of that gasoline goes into something called the Highway Trust Fund, started by President Dwight Eisenhower to build the national highway system and uh, has been in place uh, ever since. That money is collected and then distributed back out to the states based upon population, number of road miles, number of bridges, a whole complicated formula. Uh, where we're sitting today in Cleveland, uh, by way of example, Ohio gets about 3.8% of the total pot because that's our population, that's our road miles, and so on and so on. Because of more fuel efficient cars, we don't have the eight mile and a, a eight gallon, eight miles per gallon uh, fuel guzzlers anymore. Because of electric cars, because of a whole host of other things, ethanol uh, production, which receives an additional tax break, 
it, that transaction only generates about $38 billion a year. Uh, it's insufficient to keep our roads, bridges, and everything else in good repair. Uh, and because uh, you always want to make sure that you, you stay ahead of the potholes, they've been spending the balances in the trust fund, and now the money coming in is not going to be enough to, to cover the, the bottom. And, and in August, it's supposed to go broke. So, uh, you know, it's not rocket science. I mean, you got to do uh, one of a couple of things. You got to find more money or, or you have to spend less. And uh, the significant news uh, that the president announced uh, was that he wants to have a four year bill rather than a six year bill. He wants to fund it at uh, $302 billion for that, that, uh, that four years, which is roughly $75 billion a year, almost double of what the gas tax brings up. You, you correctly point, you know, the problem with the president's bill is he, he doesn't suggest how we should get the money. <laughs> right. But that's, you know, small matter, small matter. But still important that he's, he's moving the, the ball down the field and having that discussion. And likewise, what I omitted from the, uh, the uh, camp um, uh, tax proposal is he also has $125 billion uh, over uh, an additional period of time as well that would be created by his tax simplification proposal. So uh, there is a glimmer of hope that, that perhaps on this important issue, and, and really it's, it's always been bipartisan. I mean, you know, he, there's, there, there's, none, there's not a Democratic bridge, there's not a Republican road. <laughs> it really, you know, it's not a big partisan divide. So uh, if something can get legs in this election year, this silly season about to start, uh, it could be the transportation bill because at least the White House and the House Republicans appeared to be turning their attention to it. One quick follow-up question on that. You, you mentioned the, the changes, the you know, more fuel-efficient cars, electric car, cars, ethanol, all of which have played a role in reducing the amount of money that we, we take in from the gas tax. Right. There's been talk of switching away from mm -hmm. the gas tax you know, to a, a miles per gallon tax instead. Do you think that is something that's seriously going to be in play, or do you think that's for the next reauthorization? I think that's for the next reauthorization. The, the, the two proposals, one, one was sort of a sleight of hand that rather than collecting the tax at the pump on a gallon of gasoline, we would instead slap a tax on a barrel of imported oil and, and pretend that it wasn't going to equal 18 cents when it got to the gas pump. And, and so that, that one had currency for a while. But the other one was something called vehicle miles traveled, that basically uh, you would take an odometer reading, uh, and there's now electronics to do all that and feed it to Big Brother, and so you have some privacy concerns. But, but uh, that you would be charged based upon how many miles you drove. And, and just like the gas tax, the theory is if you don't have a car, and you're not ripping up the roads, then you probably shouldn't have to pay to maintain the roads. If, on the other hand, you know, you're driving an 18-wheeler and, and ripping up the road, you probably pay a little bit more. Uh, and uh, so that's the theory behind it. They're doing it very effectively in Oregon. They have a great pilot program in Oregon. But I, I don't think it's ready for prime time. The other idea that, that is sort of a, a quick shot in the arm, there's a new uh, a Democratic member of Congress from Maryland uh, by the name of John Delaney. And he has a proposal. You know, everybody always complains that all these American corporations have you know, billions of dollars parked overseas to avoid taxation. His proposal would let the corporations repatriate, bring those dollars back to the American shores, which would be good for the economy, good for employment, and so forth and so on. And if they use uh, some of that to buy bonds that would go into construction, they would pay less taxes on that than they normally would. And, uh, you know, that proposal does about $50 billion a year, and that's, uh, that's something else people are talking about. But I, I, think, I think, like, uh, what was that, uh, that wine out from California? It's, it's, I don't think it's time is here yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to age a little bit yeah, more. That's correct. Uh, the last thing I want to talk to you about was flood insurance. Yeah. Flood insurance has, has been something, you know, it's been a sort of a, a back and forth, back and forth, but without the National Flood Insurance Program, basically people will be priced out of the market in, in terms of being able to repair or rebuild their homes when you have a natural disaster. It's a program that pays for itself, but uh, again, even though that's been a nonpartisan, bipartisan issue, it was just pulled from the floor uh, uh, during the week of the, uh, uh, the 24th of February because uh, the conservatives in the House rose up 
and they're making the argument is how many times are we going to rebuild houses for people who are stupid enough to live on the beach, <laughs> you know, or live in a hurricane zone. So, now I, I don't happen to agree with that, and, you know, and as long as it's cost neutral and, and you can recover your costs and people pay premiums, it's not like we're giving some handout. Uh, but that's going to be a, a hot issue. And, and then, you know, and, and people say, you know, you might hear from somebody, flood insurance, why the heck would I want to talk about flood insurance? Well, I'll tell you who cares about flood insurance. The, the people that are, uh, have floods, one, but two, it, it creates a federal backstop for the insurance companies. And, and if, you, if we didn't have that national federal uh, flood insurance program uh, and you were a homeowner and you wanted to buy flood insurance, you couldn't afford it because the, it, it, it backs up your policy to make sure that there are funds and reserves there necessary to take. So I, I think through the months of uh, March and April, as the East and West Coast and the Gulf Coast get into the hurricane season, you'll begin to see those lawmakers sort of nudge their, their counterparts a little bit. Well, if someone had been foolish enough not to care about flood insurance before, Oof. they absolutely would care about yeah, it now. I don't get it. Congressman Lotzerat, thank you once again. Good to see you.